right, so this is this is the third uh, video in my little health series, uh, talking about my heart health, my discovery of my heart disease. Uh, mainly uh, that you know I found out I had uh, low ejection fraction of the heart, and I now have an implant. So in this video, it's uh, it's about kind of showing the the process uh, and a little education videos about about the implants, what the devices are all about, what they do, and getting one, what it's like. So um, just a little backstory in case you didn't see the other videos. Um, you know, the other two videos kind of talk about what happened. Basically, he had a small uh, blood clot, hit the brain, got a small mini stroke out of it, had a temporary vision issue on the right side of the vision field. And then uh, lots of tests and discovery of this condition, and then... Uh, put on a lot of meds, of course, uh, the usual stuff, and then uh, retesting six months after all that to then determine I need to get a device for safety because of the condition. You never know, you know, I mean, you're at high risk, you know, for cardiac arrest. And then um, some other issues I actually have. Um, I have some low conduction on uh, the lower left side of the heart that required a device that actually has the third lead uh, had to be installed by an electrocardiologist and uh, that helps with the pacing of the heart keeping it in sync with the right side of my heart um, so you know it's a little different than just some devices are just really intended for like pacemaker uh, kind of save your life if you know if your heart's racing out of control type stuff and then others have you know other functions that can provide like mine um, so that's kind of the backstory leading up to this video. I'm going to just jump right in and um, I'll just kind of show some pictures, uh, you know, as I went through the process. Uh, and then the healing process, I just, I had taken pictures kind of every day. And so I'll just have a little time, a quick time elapse. It just kind of shows kind of the healing process of the of the implant. There's a lot of bruising because, of course, I'm on blood thinners. And, and uh, so there's a lot of bruising. Um, the incision at first looks kind of, odd and you know because there's some dry blood under the glue they actually glued that shut there's there wasn't like staples or stitches actually visible um so you know toward the end of course that finally all cleared up came off and it's actually a very straight incision you know for the pocket the the device sits in there um you know it does stick out these are small devices but you know they're, st they're still kind of big actually and so this isn't uh this is just under the skin method it's not like they do another procedure where they can put it under the muscle and and it wouldn't like stick out i guess like that and um in a different procedure but mine's pretty standard procedure most people just have it done this way but yeah i mean it's you feel it it's like a little hard you know plastic device under the skin and it's kind of weird you get you get used to it i'll talk more about getting used to it in my fourth video kind of um, but like I say, I'll jump right into this one. Um, also show a little bit of information about my device, uh, by Abbott. Uh, it's the Quadra Ashura and the, uh, in the education videos, uh, I'll give credit, you know, in the description, but those are off the internet. And I thought it'd be good to kind of show some similar procedure, like how it's done. It's not me, but that's basically the way it went. And then there's a couple of videos just talk about purpose of the devices. Uh, so it's all meant to be kind of an educational video. Uh, I learned a lot and continue to learn a lot about it. And I just thought it, you know, it's interesting and others might share the interest in this content. So enjoy. Thanks for watching.
implanting an ICD is procedurally like implanting a pacemaker. We start with a sterile drip over the patient. We apply an IOBand patch for total sterility over the exposed skin. I then come in after completing a sterile scrub, gown, and gloves. We use a double glove technique to minimize any chance whatsoever of introducing an infection. We begin by shooting a venogram to identify the subclavian vein through which we'll be passing the ICD lead. Having seen that, we then plan our incision site and where the ICD will sit in the patient's chest. So with a blank marker, we identify the lateral costal margin on fluoroscopy, we want to know exactly where that is and then we'll mark that position with a black felt tip pen. Also identify where one to two finger butts below the clavicle is to plan our initial incision because we want that device to sit just over the costal margin, over the rib cage, so its position is not too lateral. Before making the incision, we infiltrate with lidocaine 1%. We use five to 10 cc's total, a copious amount to ensure complete patient discomfort. There's no need for the patient to feel any discomfort of any kind at this point. So we numb the skin thoroughly. And that is what we're doing here up along that planned incision track. And there is sharp dissection along our planned incision track. We break through the skin layer into the subcutaneous tissues. And then with cautery, we'll extend that incision down to the pectoral fascia right over top of the muscle being very careful not to break uh, the fascial plane then having done that we'll need to numb the skin inferiorly below that incision site to make the actual cradle for the device pocket so here you see us numbing below the tissue plane inferiorly where we will create the tissue pocket with electrocautery again staying as deep as possible right above the fascial plane but without breaking the fascial plane so there with we are with cautery um, dissecting through the skin layers the fascial plane right below us we have not violated that at all and as a result we'll have minimal bleeding plenty of lidocaine to minimize any patient discomfort and we want that pocket to be big enough to accommodate the ICD, which is larger than a pacemaker. Here we are getting venous access with a micropuncture needle. We're accessing the vein at the level of the ribbon first and clavicular junction. There we are with the micropuncture needle at the first rib clavicular junction, um, accessing the vein, that little flow back of blood is the venous return. Having accessed the vein, we then pass that micropuncture guide wire into the venous circulation. This allows us to apply and insert the micropuncture sheath. We then remove the stylet and wire, pass a larger J-tip guide wire, which we will use to advance the larger eight French sheath into the vein so we can implant our ICD lead. So there you see the J-tip guide wire going in through the venous circulation all the way down to the level of the right atrium. And there you see the guide wire advancing and extending down to the heart. And here we have the eight French sheath, large enough to accommodate the ICD lead being advanced into the venous circulation over that J-tip guide wire. So there we go all the way in, remove the inner dilator, dilator and the guide wire all at the same time. We're unpacking the lead from its sterile packaging. This is the ICD lead. It will have the shock coil on the lead tip, a single coil lead, really all we're using this these days. And this lead having an atrial sensing dipole that will sit in the top chamber of the heart to give us diagnostic information. So here we are inserting that lead through the eight front sheath into the venous circulation and down to the heart will advance that lead all the way down to the right atrium. Here we see it advancing through the circulation next to one of our guide wires. Now we'll place a sharp curve on the lead stylet so we can prolapse that lead tip across the tricuspid valve, thereby guaranteeing that we don't get tangled up in the tricuspid valve uh, whatsoever. No chance of that as that would be a significant complication. There we are advancing the stylet into the lead advancing the lead a little bit further and you'll see the lead tip now curving up within the right atrium and then prolapsing across the tricuspid valve avoiding any entanglement and having prolapsed across the valve we then substitute that very curved stylet for a straight stylet which we will advance to the lead body and that will extend the lead into the right ventricle and the right ventricular outflow tract. So there we are advancing that straight stylet through the lead and you'll see that lead unfold 
across the tricuspid valve into the right ventricular outflow tract. Finally, it jumps forward right there. And now we can lower that lead into the body of the right ventricle and advance that lead to the apical position. We want that lead to sit as apically as possible along the floor of the right ventricle so that it encompasses most of the ventricular myocardium within the shock trajectory should defibrillator therapy ever be unnecessary. Here we are making final adjustments. We're sensing the myocardium. We want adequate sensing. We ensure that lead is septally directed in the LAO view. We then remove that curve stylet, placing adequate slack on the lead um, so that it rides up nicely over the tricuspid valve annulus. Being careful to make sure that the shock coil is completely beyond the tricuspid valve and won't interact with the valve annulus in any way. Then with the alligator clips, we can record electrical signals from the lead. You saw signals exceeding 20 millivolts which is excellent and here we are deploying the set screw from the lead tip screwing directly into the myocardium to secure the lead usually 8 to 12 rotations is what is needed we watch that lead tip extend under fluoroscopy and having deployed the lead we then do final electrical testing making sure that the electrical signals we're sensing are large enough that the pacing thresholds are all satisfactory and having confirmed that result we then can break that outer sheath and remove the sheath so only the lead remains in the venous circulation. So there you see us breaking and peeling away the sheath, leaving only the lead, which we will then secure to the prepectoral fascia. We advance that suture sleeve um, to the site of insertion to help control any bleed back which may be coming from the vein. There we see the signaling from the atrium. 2.8, 1.9, 2.2 millivolt atrial signals for atrial diagnostics. This is a unique feature of this lead, which has that atrial sensing dipole to give us that information. And here we are now suturing that lead securely to the pectoral muscle. We use a non-resorbable Tycron suture for this. We anchor lightly to the muscle, being careful not to make the muscle ischemic, so, but still with a very secure knot, and that will be uh, the suture that we secure the lead firmly to. Here we are opening the defibrillator. The defibrillator will attach to the lead. You can see that's significantly larger than a pacemaker. These are getting smaller and smaller, but they're still bigger because of the capacitor inside, also the extended battery. And that is what we will be attaching to our defibrillator tip. Final checks under the camera for excellent position. Here we are anchoring that suture sleeve to the pectoral muscle. As I said, this is again with non-resorbable Tycron sutures, so it absolutely cannot slip or move and the patient is unable to inadvertently pull it out. Little tug test to make sure it's snug, which indeed it is. And now we'll be ready to attach the ICD to the lead. So the lead is inserted into the ICD and with that little screwdriver, we then secure the pins of the ICD within the device header. Again, very securely making sure that there's no chance of them coming out. We do the little tug test just to make sure that we have good purchase with the fastening technology there, the little set screw. So again, doing this step very carefully, we have a pin for the atrial sensing dipole as well. Now we're flushing out that tissue pocket, removing any debris or dried blood that may have accumulated there during our procedure and using this time to ensure complete hemostasis, making sure there's no bleeding from within the pocket, which could cause a complication later on. Having done that, we coil the device about the lead and fit it very snugly through that insertion um, insertion site and into that pocket that we created. We want the device to go in in the most efficient way possible to minimize the length of the incision that we needed to minimize scar, to minimize the amount of suturing that we have to do, and again, to reduce the chance of infection or any bleeding complication. Here we are closing the pocket. This we are doing this time with resorbable Vicryl sutures, beginning with a 2.0 Vicryl. We will close that deepest layer, pulling the deepest muscle layers over top of the ICD. And for, for closure, we like to do at least four suture layers in total uh, to make sure that that pocket is truly as secure as possible. Minimizes any chance of bleeding or hematoma formation, but most importantly, minimizes the chance of any infectious material entering into that ICD pocket and causing an infection-related complication. Securing very carefully right into the corners of our incision uh, to make sure that the closure is as tight and consistent as possible. There we are tying the suture down, 
Uh, this is following one of our initial layers of suture and will continue, like I said, for three to four layers total. And here's uh, my assistant now doing the skin layer. This is the final beauty layer, um, which we also do very carefully to make sure that the scar resulting from our incision is absolutely minimal. There's the lead in the heart, flexing nicely over the tricuspid valve, plenty of slack on the lead, but too much, not too much slack. You saw the atrial sensing dipole within the atrium giving us that diagnostic information. Having finished the suturing, we then cover with uh, steri strips, and finally this adhesive dressing goes over top of the um, incision. We'll keep that on the patient overnight. We'll remove it tomorrow as the patient goes out the door. We routinely take these patients one night overnight. There you saw the complete device, the defibrillator can in the left pectoral region, and the ICD lead extending into the heart. Implantable Cardioverter Defibrillator, or ICD, therapy. The electrical stimuli are generated in the SA node, the natural pacemaker of the heart. The SA node determines how often the heart beats per minute. At rest, a healthy heart beats about 60 to 80 times per minute. During ventricular fibrillation, the heart rate rises to more than 240 beats per minute. It is caused by electric pulses being transmitted in an uncontrolled manner. Regulated conduction of electrical stimuli no longer takes place. This causes the heart rate to increase so much that the heart muscle fibrillates, that is, quivers, instead of contracting properly. Blood is no longer pumped through the body. The circulation of blood, essential for the supply of life-giving oxygen, comes to a standstill. If ventricular fibrillation is not halted quickly, the brain will suffer oxygen deprivation, leading to sudden cardiac death within a matter of minutes. Implantable cardioverter defibrillators, or ICDs, can stop life-threatening ventricular fibrillation and prevent sudden cardiac death. ICDs are implanted through a small incision below the collarbone and connected to the heart via electrical leads. Through the leads, the ICD can constantly monitor the heart rhythm and deliver electric pulses to the heart when needed. Ventricular fibrillation is often preceded by ventricular flutter also called racing heart. The ICD can usually stop the rhythm disturbance through a rapid delivery of mild electric pulses to the heart. This overdrive pacing is painless for the patient. If the overdrive pacing is not successful and the heart begins to fibrillate, the ICD emits a powerful electric shock. This powerful electric surge, also called defibrillation, interrupts the ventricular fibrillation and restores the normal heart rhythm. The body is once more supplied with the oxygen and nutrients essential for life. Cardiac Resynchronization Therapy, or CRT. A healthy heart pumps blood through the body evenly and synchronously, supplying the body with oxygen and nutrients. The right and left ventricles pump the blood into the body's circulatory system. The heart's pumping motions are controlled by electric pulses. These pulses are distributed synchronously through the left and right bundle branches. 
The ventricles contract at the same time with every distributed excitation. When electrical conduction is blocked in the left bundle branch, it is referred to as left bundle branch block. The left bundle branch is blocked and the electrical stimulus is not passed on. In such cases, the electrical pulses first pass into the right ventricle. They then reach the left ventricle with a delay. The delayed excitation in the ventricles causes uneven pumping motions in the heart. The pumping force decreases and the heart muscle becomes weaker. A device for cardiac resynchronization, or CRT, can restore the even balance between the two ventricles. The device is implanted through a small incision below the collarbone and connected to the heart with three leads. The atrial lead allows the CRT device to monitor the atrial rate. The CRT device responds with electric pulses that are conducted into the ventricles simultaneously by the ventricular leads. The obstruction in the left bundle branch can thus be bypassed and the pumping motion synchronized. Each pulse from the ventricular leads synchronizes the pumping function. In this way, cardiac resynchronization improves the cardiac output and quality of life of these patients.